Hello everybody. So this video is about open individualism, loneliness, psychosis, and ecstasy. <laughs> so it's pretty fascinating that, you know, actually a lot of people find open individualism to be pretty reconforting. Like it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, um, uh, a, it causes like warm, fuzzy feelings in a lot of people, this sense of oneness and interconnectedness. And, you know, to a large extent, a lot of people pursue meditation and psychedelics because they want a feeling of oneness and interconnectedness with everybody else. To a large extent, it makes a lot of sense because it tackles this very, very deep fear of death you know, and it's important to defang death in whatever way we can because it, it just really doesn't help our lives to be completely, you know, freaked out by by the non-existence that may come uh, once we die. And open individualism does that job really well, especially, you know, once you're like starting to internalize it, you get this feeling that, hey, actually the end of my particular, you know, timeline, <laughs> my particular um, illusion of a self over time it's it's fine. I mean, I'm just going to return to the, you know, ocean of being and I will be somebody else and over and over again. And that's fine. But, you know, this actually becomes pretty troublesome in a sense uh, once it starts to consider just how much freaking suffering there is in the universe. And also, if you consider it from a new view from nowhere, you know, there's no guarantee that you will be reborn in a time in the future, or at least like nominal future, you could be reborn as a dinosaur that gets eaten alive by another dinosaur and like suffers a miserable life. You know, horrible, horrible, horrible possibilities. You know, you can be very likely reborn as a pig in a factory farm. So open individualism actually, once you kind of like start digging deeper, st starts losing some of its, you know, initial psychological appeal. And I think, you know, a lot of people get very confused about this because they go in into some meditation practice or they, you know, become a di disciple of a guru or they start taking a lot of psychedelics, expecting just to, in a sense, feel better and better the more they get interconnected with everybody. And uh, as a matter of fact, they end up being very confused and perhaps like feel strange feelings about, you know, I don't like the fact that I'm interconnected with this horrible universe <laughs> or universe that... I should, I should clarify, this universe that contains very horrible parts, I'm not going to deny there's really awesome parts to this universe, but yeah, there's very, very awful ones. And uh, to, to a large extent, I mean, this connects a little bit with ethics, which we will uh, come back to in the future, but this notion that actually, yeah, practicing open individualism in one way or in another actually gives you a sense of responsibility. It makes you care about other sentient beings and treat them as if they were yours, or at least an approximation of it, or to the extent that it's feasible given our human limitations and, and uh, inbuilt, you know, cognitive biases <laughs> that favor our own particular biological self or, you know, inclusive fitness from an evolutionary psychology point of view. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's uh, something important to consider, that like open individualism is not just a panacea, it's not just something that makes you feel fantastic, it's not just a constant orgasm, although sometimes it can feel that way. But the, the critical thing I want to actually highlight here is the key difference between the emotion that we experience given a particular idea and the intentional content, that is to say, what the idea is about. And there are very deep, you know, evolutionary reasons why certain thoughts would make us feel in a certain way. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll demonstrate this with a phenomena that actually is pretty common, uh, it seems to me, on people who start going through the open individualist path, which is uh, you get these things. Some people call it uh, solipsistic psychosis or solipsistic um, asylum. I've heard somebody mention it that way. Uh, but generally speaking, it's just like this tremendous sense of loneliness and meaninglessness uh, that you feel that, well, if you're only, the only thing that exists, there's nobody else to, you know, like be happy with or share a meal with or, or do something good towards. It's all just you. And it's, uh, that's an unpleasant state of consciousness. Now, again, highlighting the difference between emotion and the content of experience, I would claim that when people arrive at that state, which is a very dysphoric, unpleasant state, usually you just want to forget about it and perhaps even forget you ever, you know, thought about it. Um, it's very dysphoric. The, 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 what's actually going on there is that the circuits in your brain, in your limbic system, 
that basically track the feeling of loneliness and, and uh, belonging to, to the tribe where we evolved, those get activated when you deeply internalize any particular philosophy. So likewise, you know, you start believing in the Christian God and you do it deeply enough, it's going to start to activate some like pretty, pretty primitive circuits, like the circuit of like, for example, feeling cared by a, 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 a father or a mother figure, you know, the, the feeling of belonging to, to a close knit family or part being, you know, uh, 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 being in a really good relationship with your nuclear family and things like that. You know, the belief in the Christian God is going to instantiate that. But that's actually quite different than just, you know, the philosophical position of theism or the philosophical position that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is, is they're, they're actually separate. And to a large extent, there's no logical connection between a lot of the human feelings that we have and the actual, you know, intellectual content of what triggers those feelings. And I think, like, actually, that's a pretty important antidote. Like, if you are experiencing or you know somebody who's been experiencing the um, solipsistic asylum, for example, state of consciousness, it's important to remind them that, hey, introspect, when you're in that state, is it that you just believe that you're alone in the universe? Or do you also feel this feeling of loneliness? And I would actually describe the feeling of loneliness as the absence of an echo or a kind of a reverb in your consciousness. Experience actually feels very flat and anhedonic. It feels like there's nobody around you. Um, it feels very empty. And, you know, again, that would have to do with the way it constructs an emotion in you rather than what it, the idea is actually all about. Uh, and here's actually something that it becomes extremely deep, extremely interesting, and really cuts to the core of what, you know, Emotion and the meaning of life is all about, which is that there is a very non-trivial correspondence between the structure of thoughts and the way in which they feel. And there is actually a very deep reason why a moment of insight, a moment of feeling of oneness, would actually feel very, very positive. And this has to do with what we call the symmetry theory of valence, which is this notion that basically the higher the consonants of your state of consciousness is, the higher the symmetry, the more pleasant it is. And the more dissonant, the more asymmetrical or anti-symmetrical, the more unpleasant it is. With kind of like a, a, a third possibility, which is like the more noisy it is, the more neutral the experience is, is going to be. Um, and uh, basically you arrive at extremely symmetrical and harmonious states of consciousness, usually via a process of annealing. And annealing is basically something that also happens in metallurgy, where, for example, you have a, a piece of metal where the, um, the, the, the way in which the atoms are organized in it uh, basically has like cracks or imperfections. And the idea is like if you heat it up above its recrystallization temperature, basically the atoms are free to move around and if you cool it down slowly in, in, in an appropriate schedule, basically the atoms organize perfectly in, in a perfectly symmetrical lattice. And the metal acquires new and, and, and oftentimes much better properties. And in our theory, we basically think that whenever you raise the energy parameter of your experience, either through psychedelics or meditation, you will experience a, basically a, a neural annealing process where you're going to try to make the entirety of your worldview, in a sense, consistent. Now, there's many ways of making your worldview consistent. One way is to just discard all of the information that you have ever experienced before and say, oh, that's just false information and just basically believe in the present moment as is. And, you know, there's some experiences of empty individualism that, you know, that's, that's the truth that they anneal to and it feels very real and it feels extremely consistent. And yeah, of course it's consistent because you ha you're dismissing a huge amount of evidence that would contradict it. And that, that, you know, that's fine. That's fine. But critically, because there's this correlation between how ordered your state of consciousness is and how good you feel, basically any of those like hyper annealed state of consciousness will feel extremely good. They almost feel perhaps better than an orgasm. It feels like a really good, really, really, really good like massage or like, you know, taking heroin or something like that, which doesn't work through annealing, but it's a, you know, it also produces like temporarily ordered states, uh, more harmony, followed by dissonance, unfortunately. 
But the method of basically neural annealing, where you increase the energy parameter and let it cool, usually produces kind of like long-term benefits to the way you feel. However, it comes with this interesting side effect that oftentimes you will basically anneal to a worldview that maybe dismisses a lot of information and consider it's like secondary because it just doesn't fit into the worldview very well. Obviously, you see this a lot with like religious fanaticism or like a lot of like worldviews and politics that try to come up with a very simple principle to tie everything together. And of course, if you go to a rally or a mass, you know, a demonstration or, or, or religious sermon and you all get like super hyped up and the energy goes up um, and you're like right there where like, you know, those elements of the worldview get emphasized and the things that are inconsistent with the worldview are de-emphasized. Yeah, you're likely to anneal into a state of consciousness where that is the truth and it feels like the truth. And I, I would say like this actually may account for quite a lot of the unfortunate things that happen with uh, spirituality and, and uh, belief in open individualism, which is that um, there is this, this kind of like very negative attractor where basically you start believing that the only truth that matter is that we are all one consciousness. And, you know, people take it further and they might say something like the only truth that matters is that you are God and that you are imagining everything or, or worse, you're in some kind of prison universe. Uh, you're a god, but you kind of like trapped yourself somehow through a cycle of reincarnation. Or that you are god and that this is a trial that you have to undergo through in order to realize who you are and let go and, and merge into infinite love, etc., etc., etc. There's many, many ways of kind of like, kind of like a, a, achieving that particular type of obsession with oneness which I don't think it's actually helpful. And the reason I think it's not helpful is because it tends to dismiss a whole lot of information. To begin with, it dismisses things such as the existence of intense suffering and the fact that we actually have to get rid of it and that oftentimes the way to get rid of intense suffering is by actually engaging very deeply with the external world and identifying the causes and conditions that give rise to it. I mean, it's, it's not enough to, to basically, quote unquote, realize that you're God and you're imagining everything when you know somebody out there is experiencing cluster headaches uh, that would be so easy to treat if you were to, to just give them some magic mushrooms or dmt um, i know that that sounds crazy but it's true actually you know some of the absolutely most horrendous and painful experiences that people have oftentimes have like very trivial stupidly simple solutions that are just not being implemented because we don't take intense suffering very seriously so Getting obsessed with oneness and thinking that oneness is the answer to everything will literally leave millions and billions of sentient beings by the wayside, just like suffering, because you're not actually trying to help them. And I'm totally not okay with that. I think that's some kind of like strange spiritual escapism. I, I don't endorse it at all. Um, but also, you know, just saying that, hey, once you realize you're God, you have understood the, the ultimate truth of everything. From my point of view, it's actually quite the opposite. Once you, you know, realize oneness, that's just the beginning of a much, much deeper journey where you actually have to stop dismissing all of these other information, such as, for example, physics. My belief is that a deeply realized master, so to speak, would start to actually also read physics textbooks and try to understand what the hell do they tell us about the nature of consciousness and the universe and the way in which everything is interrelated. And you know, seriously, don't dismiss physics. It has like some profound beauty to it and profound simplicity that connects everything together. Just speaking at like, for example, how like principles of symmetry uh, and geometry explain things as, you know, like the conservation of mass and conservation of energy or like special relativity and you know the the effect of gravity on space-time and you know all of that is not a fiction I mean it is a fiction in some sense but you're not going to understand it by just obsessing about oneness and it's still very important because <laughs> ultimately we're one consciousness I would say physics is describing the behavior of consciousness the behavior of fields of sentience and if you actually want to improve the quality of those fields, you need to understand its actual math, how it actually works in a physical way. And 
it's not downgrading God to like equations. You know, it's actually quite the opposite. It's actually taking God seriously enough to study its freaking structure and see how you can improve it from the bottom up. Um, I think that's the only responsible path, personally. I'm also going to say that, you know, oneness doesn't in and of itself explain qualia. It doesn't explain why on earth we have experiences such as like colors and the, the correlation between symmetry and valence. It, it doesn't explain the binding problem. Like, why is it the case that only the neurons within this particular brain are contributing to the unified experience of myself? the person who's talking, <laughs> and why the neurons in your brain are contributing to the experience of yourself. Why isn't the case that, you know, if we're all one, my neurons and your neurons, why are not they not simultaneously contributing to a unified experience of its own? And there's like some super deep philosophical and scientific questions that come out of this, and you cannot possibly just dismiss them <laughs> by saying the answer is we're all one, because that doesn't actually answer those questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just dismissing them. And I think it's uh, yeah, quite, a, quite delusional to think that you have a deep insight into qualia just by thinking, realizing open individualism. Again, it's just the start. It's not the end. Uh, also problems of causality problems of, for example, um, the phenomenal experience of time, how is time embedded into each moment of experience, um, or for example, even like why MDMA makes you feel more love towards everybody. All of those continue to be like very open questions. They are not solved by oneness in and of itself. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to uh, just conclude by saying that if you feel kind of like trapped in this feeling of uh, a negative or dysphoric open individualism, I'll, I'll just emphasize that, yeah, like introspect on it. Don't, 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 don't run away from that feeling necessarily. Recognize that you're not the only person who has experienced it. Recognize that it's also just not going to break reality the way it feels it, it's going to. I mean, a lot of people feel that like once they're starting to deeply internalize oneness, they kind of like, the simulation is going to break and in a sense they they're going to exit these like space time or something like that and i think like that's just not true what's actually happening is that your world simulation in your brain is breaking down because of like changes in the parameters of it where like for example you're stopping to associate your locus of control to only your particular you know motor actions within your own nervous system and you start to associate it as well with the avatars and characters within your experience and you're starting to confuse basically the locus of identity between them all of that is a phenomena that is entirely contained within your own world simulation and it's not going to break reality <laughs> i'm pretty sure of that and uh, i yeah i would like to reassure you of that like you may feel like you're going crazy and in some sense you may but it's also something that you you will definitely be able to recover from if you basically start acknowledging that you haven't solved everything, that there's a whole lot of, you know, open questions you, you still have to address and are important and that there is suffering out there and we need to find, you know, pragmatical and empirical solutions to it. One of which might be open individualism, but it's just one piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole thing. Well, thank you very much.